Tonight's the last night of the old year, and the first night of the new year. At times like this we stop to think about the past year, what we gained, what we lost, where we were skillful and where we were not, so that we can plan for the next year, what changes we want to make. In other words, areas where we were weak, how can we make ourselves stronger? And where we have our strengths, how can we can augment them? I've noticed a lot of people talking about the past year, saying it was a horrible year. Hope the next year will be a better one. Well, remember the Buddhist standards for judging what was a good year or a bad year, a good day or a bad day, or an auspicious day or an inauspicious day. It doesn't depend on things happening to you. It depends on what you do. This year we had a lot of things happening to us. I drove home the truth. There are a lot of things in the world that are not under our control. But we shouldn't forget that there are a lot of things that are under our control. What we choose to do, we choose to say, choose to think. Those things we can control if we want to. A lot of people don't care. They just follow along with their old habits. But they're missing a huge opportunity. And we're people who practice the Dharma. That's where our primary focus has to be. What are we doing? To what extent are we committed to the path, and to what extent are we actually learning from it? The Buddha said there are two big obstacles to gaining the Dharma. One is not being committed. And the other is not reflecting. In other words, you do it a little bit. You say, well, I'm not getting the results I wanted, so you stop. And you don't stop to think, well, were you actually practicing the Dharma? Were you paying attention to what you were doing? What could you do to improve what you've done? That's what reflection is all about. Think of the Buddhist teachings to Rahula. He started out with the image of a mirror. It says in the same way that mirror is, a mirror is for the purpose of reflection. You should reflect on your thoughts and your words and your deeds again and again and again. And he showed him how to do it. First you look at your intentions. And if you think they're going to harm yourself or harm anybody else, you don't act on them. If you don't foresee any harm, go ahead and act. While you're acting, watch to see what results are coming from the action. And if you see that any harm is happening, you stop. If you don't see any harm, you can continue. When you're done, you reflect on the long-term consequences. And you realize that harm was done, then you resolve not to repeat that mistake. And then you talk it over with someone who's more advanced in the past to get that person's ideas about how you might have acted better. If you didn't harm anybody, don't see any harm, then you can take joy in the practice, the fact that you're progressing. This joy is important. We have to take joy in the skillful qualities we develop so we can encourage ourselves to develop even more. So you're combining two principles here. One is admirable friendship, consulting people who are a little bit further on the path than you are, to learn from them so you don't have to keep on reinventing the Dharma wheel. And then appropriate attention, looking at your actions, seeing where they're causing suffering, seeing where you can Make changes so you don't have to cause the suffering. And you keep at it. That's how you combine commitment and reflection. You know, those are general principles. And the Buddha said, you apply this to the threefold training. Because you realize the mind needs to be trained. And that's what the commitment is. You realize that when the mind is untrained, it can cause itself a lot of suffering, even in good conditions. 
But when the mind is well trained, then even when things are bad outside, you don't have to suffer. And so the training is training in heightened virtue, heightened mind, and heightened discernment. So it's good to take stock. How do your virtues measure up to heightened virtue? How does your concentration measure up to heightened mind? And how does your discernment measure up to heightened discernment? You take that as your measuring stick for what's a good year and what's not a good year. In terms of your virtue, you start with the basic principles of the five precepts. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking intoxicants. And the Buddha says you hold to these in a way that is untorn and unsplattered. In other words, you really stick with them in all circumstances. But there's more than that. He said you follow these precepts in a way where you don't grasp at them. In other words, you don't build a huge amount of conceit around the fact that you are more virtuous than other people. Because that conceit is going to turn around and bite you at some point. You realize you're in this for the training, and not to measure yourself against others. So you can make another analogy. You've got a disease, and this is the treatment for the disease. And if other people have that disease but they're not taking the medicine, that's their business. Your business is basically making sure that you are taking the medicine. Your virtues are your business. That's where you have to keep your attention focused. At the same time, in addition to being not grasped at, they are conducive to concentration. In other words, you don't get yourself tied up in knots around the minutiae of the virtue. You, you stick with the little details. As John Mun once told to John Fung, very few Few people have ever gotten blinded by having a log in their eyes. But a lot of people have been blinded by sawdust. The little things can take you down. But you don't want to make them a cause for unnecessary worry and concern. And there's some people who get themselves all tied up in knots. No purpose of virtue is so you can get the mind to settle down. So you can look at your behavior and see there's nothing harmful you've done. So take things in proportion. This is why it's heightened virtue. It's a skill. You're not just following the rules, but you're following the rules with the right attitude. So you can get the results that you're aiming at. Which goes on to the next part of the triple training, which is heightened mind. Basically it's the practice of concentration. It's heightened in the sense that you're focusing the mind not on ordinary issues. For a lot of people, when they get concentrated, they're concentrated through lust or concentrated through anger, concentrated through greed, fear. They get obsessed with certain topics with these defilements, and their minds can hold on to them for a long time. But that's not the kind of concentration we want. The Buddha said right concentration starts when you let go of unskillful qualities. Everything from wrong view up through wrong mindfulness. You develop skillful qualities in their place. And you let go of sensuality. You're concerned with your sensual pleasures of the day. What food you like to eat, where places you like to go. You put all that aside. You want to be right here. Right where the body and the mind meet at the breath. And you want to learn how to make that your default mode. This is where you're concentrated. This is your home. So if you find yourself slipping away from this, try to bring yourself back. It is possible to stay focused, centered inside, as you go through the day. And if you notice that anything that would come up in the mind that would pull you back to lower concerns, 
knew how to say no. Now this is going to involve some discernment. Where you can step back from your thoughts and look at them not in terms of what you like to think about, what you don't like to think about, but look at them in terms of where they're going to lead you, where they're coming from. And this is where heightened concentration, where heightened mind leads to heightened discernment. You get more and more objective about your thinking processes. You look at your thoughts not so much in terms of the content, but in terms of the fact that the thought is an action, and is an action that has an influence. Thoughts can lead either to suffering or away from suffering. And so you look at your thoughts. The Buddha said he got on the right path when he was able to divide his thoughts into two types. Those that were imbued with sensuality, ill will, harmfulness. Those are the unskillful ones that he had to keep in check. Same way that a goat herd would beat back his cows when he saw that they were getting the rice and during the season when the rice was getting ripe. But then there are thoughts that are imbued with renunciation, in other words, you're willing to drop sensual concerns, imbued with non ill will, i.e., goodwill, and harmlessness, compassion. Those thoughts, he said, you could allow, because they're coming from a good part of the mind and they're going to lead you to a good place. But even then, thinking good thoughts like that all day long can tire you out. So you go back to concentration. So what we're doing here is lifting the level of the mind, training the mind. with three aspects that connect with one another. Heightened virtue is meant to make it easier to get the mind concentrated. Heightened discernment is meant to make it easier to get the mind concentrated. Heightened mind helps with your virtue and helps with your discernment. And your discernment helps with your virtue. It's not the case that you perfect your virtue and then you go to concentration and then you go to discernment. You work on all three because they help one another along. So as you enter the new year, think about which aspects of this training are still lacking. Because that's what the Buddha's teachings are. It's a course of training. They're not just nice thoughts to think about and discuss. They're directives. This is what you do with your mind. This is what you do with your speech. This is what you do with your bodily action for the sake of putting it into suffering, because the suffering that weighs the mind down isn't what comes from outside. That's what comes from inside. So when you learn, learn how to put an end to that internally generated suffering, that's why it's auspicious. Think of that image of a John Sawat pointing to the mountain over there on the horizon. He asked, is it heavy? You know, when a John asks a question like that, you don't just come out blurting out with any answer. And then he answered the question for himself. He said, if you try to pick it up, yes, it's heavy on you, but if you don't try to pick it up, it's not heavy at all. It may be heavy in and of itself, but it's not heavy on you, and that's what matters. So there are times when the affairs of the world may seem like mountains. And think of the mountains moving in, crushing all living beings in the Buddha's image. But you don't have to pick them up. And you can train the mind so it has something inside that can't be crushed even by mountains. That's what we're working toward. And so whatever you can do to work in that direction, it's all to the good. It's all auspicious. The days in which you do that are auspicious days. The months, the years in which you do that, they're auspicious months, auspicious years.
Don't let events that happen to you overcome the mind. Develop the mind strength so it can take care of itself, whatever happens. That's when your practice really is a blessing, and the blessings spill out. The more people can control their minds, the more peace there will be in the world. This is a practice where everybody benefits.